Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to welcome you all in person in this room and many on Zoom. Uh, we, it's a webinar that will be recommended and broadcast. So, hope nobody has any objection to that. Um, uh, very happy to have this event to release the book, uh, India Palestine. We are very grateful to the library event series for hosting us and also the SOAS uh, HR history, religion, and philosophy department for providing some of the funds uh, to travel. Um, welcome to Victor Kassan, who with Amit Ranjan who, uh, has edited the book. Um, I'm welcoming him back to his alma mater. So his, he did his PhD here. Uh, and uh, in fact, when he was doing his PhD, I used to teach a course in, in, on comparing India-Palestine partition in 2009 for a couple of years. And so there's a very old genesis to this project, but uh, I'm very happy to see it happen. And Victor will introduce the book and talk about it um, shortly. I welcome all our speakers as well. And their credentials, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So, uh, oh, and I welcome you all with that uh, little discount code. So hopefully if anybody wants to buy the book, uh, you can use the SOAS 30 code. And then you order it on the NDP website. So uh, welcome to the event. Um, Victor, I, I, I'm not going to read out everybody's credentials because they are impressive and long. And I'm so uh, glad that they are here, but they are also here to speak. So we will keep more time for that. So I have that on the slides if, for everybody's information, but I'm not going to read out um, everybody's uh, biographies, but very welcome to Mohamed Ali Adraoui. He's joining us from Paris and teaches at Radboud University uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, he's had a long uh, publication. If you go to the next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, he's got a lot of publications working on the Salafis and the Muslim Brotherhood, and he will talk about his contribution to the book shortly. Uh, our next speaker will be, so it should have been Ari Dabno. So I should have, I switched it, sorry. The first is Ari Dabno, after that, Mohamed Ali. And uh, Ari Dabno is visiting us from George Washington University in the US. He's a named chair prof professor there. Um, and he has published on Jewish liberal thought as well as partition in the international context. Um, and you can see his uh, impressive list on the slides. So very welcome here. Um, Ari, after that, we will have Victor speak again about his contribution. So not only has he edited the book, but he has also um, written the No, after Mona Yes. Sorry, I switched the introduction around, <laughs> but we'll keep that uh, order. I mean, there is. The only logic behind the order is the surnames. <laughs> so uh, I thought I'll consider it like that. And after we, we will have uh, Laura, so I'm very well with her. She's coming, uh, she's here from Penn State University. And I'm very- Sorry, can you speak up please? Oh yeah, thank you. I said I was welcoming Laura Robson. She, Professor Robson is here from Penn State University in the in the US as well. So very grateful to both of them making this long journey uh, to speak to us and share their thoughts on, the, uh, on their contribution in this book, but perhaps they can also reflect on the, uh, the greater issues of uh, comparing these partitions. After these presentations, we will, uh, next slide, we will have respondents uh, to the book by Nandini Chatterjee. She is, at Exeter University and uh, has recently been appointed to the University of Oxford. She's worked on, a, uh, on the broad comparative Persian field in the Indian Ocean world, law and empire in the in this, uh, uh, over the long new race from the Mughal to the modern times in India, uh, or to the 19th century in India. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to her comments on the book and the different contributions. Um, last but not least, Professor Adif Alasher, he's at University of Westminster. He will be one of the respondents as well, and uh, he's worked on nationalism and 
Palestine and, uh, literature and nationalism, so bringing in culture and politics as well. So welcome to all of us and uh, to all of you for uh, making the time to hear about the book and ask questions. Uh, we are going to try and keep the presentations within the hour and then an hour for discussions and questions. Those online can give the questions on the Q&A um, box or maybe the chat as well. Yeah, and uh, maybe when we are discussing it, you can unmute yourselves and talk. Yes, and Charles is uh, very grateful to Charles for coordinating the everything from organizing this place as well and posting the event on the, on the webinar. So he will help us ask, answer the questions in the question session. Mm -hmm. So I'll switch now with Atif if you would like to join me, join us okay. here. Okay. You're okay then? All right. When you're speaking, then because for the webinar, the camera will be easier here. All right. Okay, so without much ado, then uh, I ask Victor, please, to share your, introduce the book to everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Amrita. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be back at, at SOAS after uh, uh, so many years. And um, it's a tribute to you, uh, um, Amrita, for bringing so many of us together in person. I think half the authors or half the contributors uh, to this book are actually here. It's quite quite a feat with funding cuts and everything yeah. else. So, um, so that's a, a, a very impressive. So, I was based at the uh, National University of Singapore for many years before I returned to the UK um, uh, during the the pandemic. And this project um, began uh, in Singapore. The next slide. So, it was a joint a joint initiative uh, by the Middle East Institute, where I was based at the time as a senior research fellow and the Institute of South Asian Studies, where my colleague Amit Ranjan uh, is, is a fellow. And it was uh, organized in this rather uh, beautiful room at the Asia Europe Foundation and this kind of tropical rainforest. Um, did it on the 70th anniversary of the uh, partition of, of India. And uh, at the time, the Middle East Institute was headed by um, uh, Professor Eng Seng Ho, who is a, 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 a well-known historian and anthropologist based at Duke University, but originally from Malaysia. And uh, what he was trying to do at the time was to create a distinctive Middle East Institute uh, in Singapore to make it do something different to what Middle East Institutes do in London or in Washington, D.C. And so he, his main area was looking at Indian Ocean diaspora as a movement of people and culture between Arabia and Southeast Asia. And so we were encouraged to do comparative projects, comparative work to make you know make it stand out to to other other uh, institutes. So uh, there were two projects I was involved with. One was comparing the uh, legal arguments about the Vietnam War and the Arab Arab Israeli conflict. The second project was this one, comparing partition uh, in India in 1947 to 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 what's happening in in Palestine uh, around the same time. So uh, and the project came together. Uh, we had a, quite a mix of, of scholars. We have uh, international historians. Uh, uh, we have lawyers. We have uh, political scientists. Um, so it was a, a multidisciplinary, uh, if you like. Um, the next slide. So the book's published by Manchester University Press. Um, <laughs> If you click on the link, will it uh, on the link there? Does it work? <laughs> Just to give you an overview of what you might expect to see, and you click on the table of contents. Brilliant, yeah. So the way in which the book is structured is we have uh, some big names like revisiting their canonical work. So Ayesha Jalal, who's written a lot on uh, 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 Pakistan history of Pakistan, the partition of the Punjab, uh, was asked to revisit her work on on. Um, Muhammad Ali Jinnah's role, and Ian Talbot has done a lot of work on, 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 the, on the Viceroy, Lord Mountbatten, uh, kind of revisited his work. And then we had scholars, two of whom are with us today, looking at the partition of Palestine, and then comparative work by Amrita and, P and Professor PRS Kumaraswamy. And then we looked at consequences, because we don't see partition as something that began and ended in 1947, or I should say the failed partition in Palestine, and the, or the forced partition of Palestine, and, and in, and in India, but, but events that continue to have repercussions and influence the politics uh, of both regions today. And some of the, the speakers will be saying um, more about this. 
So the point of doing the comparison is not to say that they're identical or they're the same, but also to look at the differences. Um, and, and, and if we go to the next slide. <laughs> and so we, 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 we did something that was different to uh, previous scholarship. So previous work, including that by uh, uh, Ari and Laura, who are with us today, and the older work by the Irish historian T.G. Fraser, uh, tended to do the, look at the tripartite partitions, islands, India and Palestine. But we thought it was worth focusing just on India and Palestine, uh, principally, uh, but not exclusively, because of the time reason. So it was this particular moment in international politics uh, when uh, the Soviet Union emerged on the stage and influenced international relations. There was this discourse of national self-determination. Uh, there was a decolonization in the third world, if you like, began uh, after after World War II. Whereas in the Irish case, it, it's still they're still using civilizational language. It's still a white European Christian state that's, that's articulating a claim to nationhood. It's a different uh, uh, historical moment. And of course, it, apart from the, the, the similarity uh, in, in in terms of the the timing of the partitions, uh, well, the fact that the colonial power was the same the British Empire, although the status of the territories was, of course, different. Palestine being a League of Nations mandate and India being a, 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 a essentially a colony of, 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 the, of the British uh, Empire. We turn to the next slide. And of course, if we're talking about partition, we're talking about a subcontinent. We're looking at Punjab and Bengal, and then you know, the war over Kashmir, uh, whereas Palestine was really a unit or subunit of the um, Ottoman Empire when it was carved out in, in after the First World War. And another big difference between the two, of course, is Palestine. There wasn't set the colonialism on the scale uh, uh, in, 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 in India as there was in Palestine, which also affected the, the arguments that were advanced in favor and against partition. Then there are personalities uh, where there's, that there's similar similarities in terms of those who are articulating or supporting or opposing partition, whether that was British colonial officials um, Coupland and others who, who Ari and Enrique have written about, or whether it was views of uh, the Muslim League, the All India Muslim League, kind of opposing uh, uh, the partition uh, of Palestine, uh, uh, articulating a claim to um, majority rule. Uh, also, Jinnah as well, sorry, also um, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru as well, coming out at that time in opposition to the partition of Palestine, having accepted it uh, in in India. So there's some quite, some quite interesting juxtaposition work to be seen comparing why in, in certain cases uh, they favoured partition, uh, but in other cases uh, they were opposed to it. Um, last slide. So without much further ado, uh, we're going to let our, our, my colleagues discuss their individual chapters, uh, and I'll discuss mine as well. I think we're going to start with Ari. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Victor. Uh, first and foremost, congratulations to you and, and me on bringing together uh, um, um, such a, a stellar collection of, of um, authors and also doing the hard, the, the always ungrateful work of being an editor. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the metaphor of cat herding is also used in that respect. And thank you for bringing us together. Uh, so my, uh, um, I'll try to be brief, my, my two, two cents or 10 minutes, I'll try to briefly um, um, highlight the main points of my intervention in, in the chapter that, uh, the chapter I contributed to this volume. Um, um, my chapter focuses on the 1948 war in Palestine and tries to do a global reframing and to think about whether we can think about it in new ways by, so to speak, rebranding it or recalling it a war partition. Um, and I'll maybe say a few words about how uh, the backstory, how I came to write it. Uh, in a sense, it's, it grew out of uh, a deep frustration from the existing historiography. Um, I think that um, much of what um, the appeal of project of this kind has to do with the fact that uh, over the years, um, nationalist and local histories accumulated a lot of information about the local partitions. We know 
uh, extremely well and extremely well detailed um, um, chronicles, of course, of the different events taking place in Palestine. Very detailed um, analysis of of what's going on in the Punjab and and Bengal and other areas. Uh, but a much of the historiography, especially when it comes on the on the Israeli side, is suffering from a heavy mythological nationalism. So it's a very nationalistic history. It reads everything from a nationalist uh, point of view. Um, by, by saying I'm trying to move away from it, I'm not saying I am discarding the tools of nationalism studies. I think we live in a time and an age when the, 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 the insights of nationalism studies is still relevant. What I mean by um, methodological nationalism is a tendency to read history uh, in a very teleological way, everything, all the roads lead to Rome and all the uh, historical processes lead to the creation of an independent state. Uh, and also lack of willingness sometimes to zoom out to see the case, uh, not only in its uniqueness, of course, every historical case is unique, but to see uh, the certain patterns of, of similarity. So sort of a bit of a forest versus tree uh, phenomena. Uh, that is taking place there, um, and um, and also by reading the source materials themselves, the primary sources. I'm trained as a historian. It it struck me. It strikes me often to see how the the documents coming from uh, from the period show uh, reveal historical agents that are much less parochial than we are often. They are acutely aware of the fact that they are part of an imperial setting. They are busy constantly comparing themselves to other places. Uh, they they have almost uh, some sort of a, sometimes uh, an understanding of some sort of a butterfly wings effect that even a development elsewhere in the in the in the empire, um, remote as it may sound, might have a ripple effect and and will come to them. And this is part of what kind of pushed me in that direction. On a more positive note, it was kind of a part of what I was trying to do is, of course, to, to follow you know, a, a sequel to what uh, I had the pleasure of working on with Laura when we put the three partitions uh, together and start talking not only about comparing them, but identifying a transnational connection between them. So if uh, uh, we try to move beyond uh, Fraser's old, older story um, and maybe uh, is really to take the imperial term seriously and to do a transnational history that not only sees, puts all the three cases in, or the two cases side by side, but, but saying the similarities are not uh, coming out of nowhere. There are clear dots connecting them. Um, so uh, what is happening if we are starting to think about the war taking place in Palestine? Uh, in 1947, eight, officially starting the, 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 the official chronicles, the the, uh, uh, the war the Palestinians will call the Nakba, the Israelis will call the War of Independence, starts on the day after Resolution 181 uh, is passed in the UN, which is the partition resolution. So what happens if we start thinking about it as a war of partition uh, and seeing it in that in that context? So. Part of what I'm trying to um, suggest in the chapter is that many of these political actors have in their mind the partitioned space, and the, the aim of the violence is to create, to turn the theory into, a, in, in, into something which is actual on, on the ground. The war also starts in the phase where the British are still present in Palestine. So the war starts in November 1947. The British are still there until May 1948. Um, so part of what uh, you see already in these immediate first phases are patterns of violence that are um, strikingly similar to other places of partition uh, violence. What I also try to do in the chapter is to scrutinize, even put it more boldly, um, um, discard older narrations and conceptualizations of that war. For instance, there was a tendency among Sami Sorans, both Palestinians and Israeli, to call the first phase of the war a civil war. Um, the, the idea of calling it a civil war was simply to allude to the fact 
that nominally there was still British mandatory presence, uh, and uh, communities were starting to clash. And this is uh, something you can find both in Walid Khalidi's uh, uh, early works and also in historians like Benny Morris. Uh, and it started as a periodization, actually, device to say, how do I call the first phase of the war? Part of what I'm trying to argue in the in the in the chapter is that it's a bit of a misnomer. It really misses the dynamic. It it it's completely divorced from the way um uh, the Jewish side when they were thinking, when they were employing metaphors of civil war, it was always an intra-Jewish debate. So these were internal strides between different um um uh, brands of, of Zionism, between fighting between the left-wing uh, Zionists and the right-wing Zionists. This is where you see in the historical records uh, attempts to call it a civil war. But the, the ethno-nationalist logic of that conflict uh, uh, that really makes the civil war metaphor a bit of a misnomer that, that is not serving us well analytically. The second term that I tried to discard is, is total war uh, for different reasons. I would not go into them now. Um, and the last point is to argue that, uh, and that alludes to a comment Victor made earlier, and I think is, is very correct, and this is my cue. Uh, partition we is not only uh, this one big bang, very violent, that is only about the war. Partition is an ongoing project, and often partition is a, um, something that is achieved later on through bureaucrats, from clerics, from legal uh, um, 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 scholars that are creating sets of laws that turn the partition to reality on the ground. And that's kind of the last uh, um, uh, argument of, of the chapter. Um, so my time is up. So yeah. I will pass the baton to uh, I'm the next speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much to all of you. Thank you to my dear brother, Victor. Actually, we have met in Singapore, so this plate that you have seen is basically where we have uh, we have mingled for so many years, Victor and I and family. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I was extremely happy, honored to be part of this very, very, very exciting project and to be here with such distinguished colleagues. So um, I will try to say a few words on a very, very another side of the of the partition of Palestine, not India, are more interested in the near and the Middle East. I'm, let's say, basically, I was trained as a political scientist with a bit of history work um, dealing with the Middle East history and contemporary and periods. And I'm within this, I am, let's say, um, if I had to describe myself, I'm more interested in um, the fields of political Islam, political Islam studies or Islamist studies. And my chapter um, in this volume had to deal basically with how an Islamist movement, and I'm going to try to give some definitions in a few seconds, um, has tried or has de facto reacted to a partition of a land called Palestine that was never seen as, uh, as a as a territory, as a as a land, of course, with a population, with all the symbolical side of it, uh, as a land, as a fact that was meant to be um, taken away from the Muslims. Uh, Palestine. Palestine, of course, a very strong Arab nationalistic uh, interest, importance, but maybe first and foremost, because we are dealing here with Islamist forces and Islamist movement, the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, with a very strong, super strong, uh, maybe first and foremost, religious uh, appeal, religious importance. So, and that's my first set of remarks. Second one, when I had to, I started, I mean, um, thinking about this presentation, um, a title came to my mind, actually, because, of course, we have we have no, no one here ignores what's going on, uh, I mean, today in the Gaza Strip and beyond. And that has been going on actually for so many years, but more accurately um, in the next few months. I would be, I would like to suggest this idea because um, this title could be nothing new, question mark. Um, let's try to go back to the long durée. Uh, why, why do I use this expression, nothing new? It's because if we look at the, the archives, how this Syrian Muslim Brother organization has reacted uh, in terms of discourses, in terms of mobilizations, in terms of actions, um, um, this, this partition plan, actually we have many similarities with what's going on today. Everybody knows here, I presume here knows about Hamas, which is a um, Islamist force within the Palestinian political and religious field. We know about some of their, let's say, key strong, let's say, uh, characteristics in terms of ideology, in terms also of political um, uh, types of mobilizations. And actually, we find many of these of these um, characteristics. Actually, if we go back to, if we uh, start discussing and studying the issue, the issue, sorry, of the, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, 60, 70, 80 years ago. 
So, for example, just to give you to start with this, oh my God, what's happening here? Oh God, sorry, what's happening? Okay, I'm trying to. So, how I hope to give you a few attempts of different definitions. The Muslim Brotherhood is supposed or is usually described, characterized as the first strong key Islamist player in the history of the Middle Eastern countries. The, Mis the Muslim Brotherhood was founded in the late 20s in Egypt uh, with a teacher called Hassan al-Banna. And quite rapidly, actually, this movement, and of course with the ideology um, um, coming with this movement, um, it started actually to generate offshoots across the region, first and foremost, and then at a global level. Syria is one of the very first countries, actually, where the Muslim Brotherhood ideology has settled. And we usually consider that the mid-40s is the time basically when the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood uh, starts to emerge. So the partition plan actually came quite quickly, uh, one or two years after the um, the foundation or the creation of this uh, Islamist organization in the Syrian political and religious um, spectrum or field. And number two, we usually another, and I'd be happy to discuss this with my colleagues um, in a few minutes, we usually consider actually whether it's right or wrong that nationalists have been the key force, the initial original key force in the pro-Palestine and anti-partition uh, mobilization types of or sets of a set of mobilizations. And actually we could reconsider this with um, by focusing and going back to the history of the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, because for example, right from the beginning, right just before the partition plan, October, Everybody knows here, presumably, that the partition plan happened in the late uh, in late November 1947. In early October 1947, already we have the Damascus Committee, which is a creation. It was generation generated, sorry, by the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood as the first. Um, committee, the Damascus Committee, uh, in order actually to mobilize the Syrian people and to um, let's say um, make people aware of the fact that they're really danger, threat, I'm talking uh, here, I'm using the words that the Muslim Brothers at the time used to used to used to used to characterize the situation through. And actually, starting in October um, 1947, with this Damascus committee, the first times of Islamists, the first generation, let's call it this way, of Syrian Islamist um, um, reactions and mobilization started to be observed, actually, so right from the beginning. Uh, so even a few weeks, actually, at some point uh, before, prior to the partition plan, and the, the trend from this moment onwards is going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. So I would be happy to give you um, a few, a few, um, a few, a few examples of this. A few declarations. For example, we have um, the one of the main um, leaders of the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood, starting almost right from the beginning. We are here now in October 1947, starting to use um, or to call people for violence. Uh, for example, I can I can say, tell you a few. I can mention a few um, a few examples. Uh, for example, they are saying one of them, a very famous uh, Syrian Muslim Brotherhood le leader, Mohammed Mubarak, was from, right from the beginning. Um, so we have in the, th uh, the 3rd October, the 3rd October 3, sorry, 1947, we have a very famous speech in which he was calling for um, Palestine, or he was asking for Palestine to be defended through bloodsheds and um, things like that. So it's going to be stronger and stronger. And after the, um, the partition plan, when it was officially declared in, the, in uh, November 29, 1947, a few days after that, another very strong um, type of mobilization is going to be observed um, um, in uh, early December um, 1947, December 4, with the uh, so-called first according to me at least, I mean in the Syrian context, the first official proclamation of jihad. It was a proclamation made by, not only here in this case, to be honest, Muslim brothers or Muslim brother leaders, it was made by the League of Ulema, so the League of Islamic Scholars, Rabbit and Ulema uh, in Damascus, and it was, and I would be happy to tell you, to give you the, the extract, I mean, to give you the content of this. So the first, let's say, and of course jihad, we all know here, I mean, probably, uh, at least we should, that jihad is a very diverse, has generated very sometimes opposite diverse understandings, but here in this case it's clearly um, a reference to a very violent form of jihad in order to defend Palestine, which is no longer here described and um, uh, led to be defended on behalf of some nationalistic discourse or symbols or narratives. Here clearly, of course, I mean, they had a very, very famous nationalistic, I mean, very nationalistic, I mean, um, 
uh, motivation. But also, maybe first and foremost, we have here right from the beginning in this period of time in early uh, December 1947, a kind of Islamization of this call of this um, uh, of this of this motivation of um, uh, keeping Palestine away. Um, uh, from the Zionist forces. So I'd be happy here to, I'm happy here to give you um, some extract of this very famous proclamation. So quotes in quotes. So here we have a very famous Muslim brother being part of this League of Scholars who is speaking here. The Palestine question today preoccupies the Arabic and Islamic words. So not only the Arabic words, the Arabic and Islamic words. Every Arab and every Muslim uh, prepares himself to fulfill his duty against the fallen Zionist peril which is supported by the great imperialist power with all their force and influence. Having considered the seriousness of the situation in Palestine, the League of Ulema, scholars, Islamic scholars, finds it is its duty to declare the necessity of jihad in money and source uh, for the restoration of the unity of Palestine and its Arab structure. Uh, Islam, which by nature tends towards peace, does not accept aggression and, tra and transgression and cannot stand still before slavery and injustice. In such a case, Islam requires each capable person, capable person to fulfill his duty in jihad until God makes him a martyr or the Almighty gives Okay, all the Almighty gives a victory and success to his country. And I could go on and on and on. So this idea, for example, that nationalism had prevailed in the beginning can be discussed, I mean, um, um, by focusing and studying, I mean, the importance of the Muslim Brotherhood um, based or designed types of mobilizations. And I would like to end up on one idea, and I hope I'm not going to be too long. It's if we, one, once again, one more time goes to this long durée necessity, we can also figure out actually the idea that Palestine, the Palestine, Palestinian cause, the Palestinian um, struggle, the struggle for Palestine, Palestine has also in the long term be key, be a driving force, both ideologically, but also maybe also we tend to forget that, and I'll be happy to give you more evidence of this, sociologically, in the rise, consolidation of Islamist forces throughout the Middle East for so many decades. And I'll be happy to give you more examples, but we know that without Palestine, that's one of the ideas I would be happy to defend here and to discuss, of course, that without the Palestinian factor, Islamism would have probably not been framed or shaped the same, the same way it is or it has been in the last, uh, or for the last um, decades. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Victor, please. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to hear, hear from Ari and Muhammad Ali. Um, so my chapter uh, looks at, uh, there's a comparison between the uh, the uh, partitions of India and Palestine, and I argue that this notion of majority rule, uh, this idea that it's for the majority population of a given unit to determine their political destiny emerges from the debates uh, in opposition to uh, attempts by the United Nations to partition Palestine, and also uh, discussions amongst Muslim leaders who are opposed to partition, initially opposed to partition in, in India. And the old Indian Muslim League favored a form of majority rule, but only in the areas where Muslims formed the majority of the population. And you can imagine why, in a, if, if, if in a, they were worried about this notion of what they called it, a Hindu Raj, that uh, they were worried about the communal, they would be a minority in a single unitary state, and therefore they, they, a federal structure uh, was more suitable uh, uh, following the departure of the British. So it looked at these debates, it looked at attempts by the Muslim, all India Muslim League to challenge uh, British colonial policy in Palestine, including debates on going to what was called the Permanent Court of International Justice just before World War II. And I draw comparisons to a later attempt by Ethiopia and Liberia to bring us to use a similar clause and another treaty to challenge apartheid in, in, in South Africa. Uh, I look at the role of uh, Mohammed Zafrullah Khan, who was uh, a judge on the Federal Court of India, um, a prominent leader of the Muslim League. Um, the foreign minister, first foreign minister of Pakistan, and then a judge and president of the International Court of Justice. And I draw attention to the fact that they came out against the Pakistan scheme as early as 1940. And then I... Hmm? The Palestine scheme. Uh, the Pakistan scheme. They, they came out opposed to, to partition. Um, I'll show you a slide shortly. Um, in 1940. And so it kind of feeds into what uh, Ayesha Jalal argues, that Jinnah only succumbed to partition because he was placed under tremendous pressure to accept it. 
in the final hour, but they preferred the cabinet mission plan. I've been shout out both Pakistan, it newly, uh, uh, Pakistan and India when they became members of the United Nations, both voted against the United Nations partition plan for Palestine. And again, in opposition, they were articulating language and discourse based on this idea that self national self-determination meant majority rule. And then I explained how that idea then feeds into debates uh, against uh, minority rule in, in Southern Africa and the struggle against apartheid. So what, one of the issues that I highlight in the chapter is this attempt to challenge British colonial policy uh, during the, uh, the mandate, um, which hasn't received much attention in, in the literature. Uh, this is a picture of Chowdhury Kalukazaman, who uh, was a very senior member of the All India Muslim League. He travels to London in 19, so 1939. Uh, some of you will know the British essentially ba abandoned the Balfour Declaration in their famous uh, white paper. And prior to that, there was a, a meeting, a round table meeting with, meeting, uh, with uh, leaders of um, the, the Arab world. Uh, what, what's not so well known is that the All Indian Muslim League, not, despite not being invited, turned up and were advising the Arabs uh, from behind the scene. It's quite interesting, actually, I advised the Palestinians uh, to accept the white paper because they said the Brits would never, would never, um, would never, uh, if you accept it, uh, eventually they, they will leave and you'll have majority rule uh, in any event. But anyway, the Palestinians rejected it. Um, and, uh, but during, during the sidelines of this discussion, there were discussions, they, they made a formal complaint to the British colonial office about uh, a legal complaint based on this notion of sacred trust of civilization in the League of Nations covenants. Um, and they also uh, spoke to uh, uh, League of Nations officials in Geneva about trying to bring a case. I don't think they would have succeeded in bringing that case for various reasons I won't go into, but the fact that they were sinking along the lines of bringing, uh, using the dispute settlement clause in the mandate to challenge the policies of the colonial power was is just absolutely fascinating if you're a lawyer, because this is exactly the same way in which uh, South Africa's apartheid policy was challenged in, in Namibia. So next slide. Um, and so it's also quite intriguing to, 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 to and so the key, another key figure was uh, this gentleman, Mohammed Zifrullah Khan, and he was very close to Jinnah, and uh, he again came out opposing population transfers. You know, he the, opposed the, the this idea of creating a, a sovereign Pakistan state because he knew there were as many, if not more, Muslims living in, in, in other parts of India as they were in, in the Punjab and uh, the northwest frontier, Punjab, Bengal, and, and, and other places. Uh, and so they actually implored them to abandon what they called the Pakistan scheme because it would be utterly impractical and would result in nothing but misery and suffering and can therefore make no contribution towards the solution of India's problems. Kind of intriguing given that some people claim that the Muslim League wanted a uh, uh, wanted partition. But, but, but what's key to understand is that they favored nationhood in those areas where, they were, where the population um, was the majority. And of course the partition was done in a form of majority rule, dividing tessils between a majority Muslim and non-Muslim populations. And then that led to, as you all know, the horrors of the India of the Holocaust in the Indian subcontinent and a massive movement of, of people um, suffering until this day. So uh, during this time, during the in the in the aftermath of the Second World War, when uh, uh, India, um, British, uh, India and, and Pakistan become independent states, the Palestine issue returns or is placed on the agenda of the United Nations General Assembly. And we have a photograph here of uh, Muhammad Zifrullah Khan, who is uh, uh, um, essentially become King Faisal and, and, and Egyptian leaders. And they were, they were, he was advising them, so he's a very prominent lawyer, and he was advising them essentially how to, to deal with the imperial powers, Sorry. being uh, very um, skilled and familiar with these issues themselves. So he, he, he did it as an extremely powerful an eloquent speech, if you haven't seen it, I think you watched on, on, the, on, on, the, on the UN website now, explaining why the partition plan was madness, because it was uh, uh, according sovereignty to, to large parts of Palestine where uh, uh, Arabs continue to be the, either the majority population or the majority of, of landowners, and explain why this was completely contrary to self-determination that had just been proclaimed by the United Nations. And if you go to the last slide, 
I then explain how these arguments based on majority rule coming out of these debates in the Indian subcontinent, coming out of the debates on the partition of Palestine, plus the movement, uh, the, the independence of a lot of North African countries in the, uh, and, in, and Indonesia in the late 1940s and early 1950s results in this the articulation that, that democracy means majority rule, it's a flawed interpretation, of course, but, but this kind of powerful uh, nationalistic uh, notion of uh, uh, self-determination. Then it feeds, I also show how it feeds into discrediting apartheid in South Africa, which initially began as a debate about the status of individuals of Indian origin. It was never just about one man, one vote, or based on complete non-discrimination. Initially, the UN, I'm talking about the official diplomatic structures, was focused on, 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 what, on, on, the, on the status of, Indi of individuals or Indian South Asian descent. But what happened in 1952 is, is this, this new agenda is brought to the General Assembly. It's letter by mostly uh, Muslim majority countries is written, and they, for the first time, break that focus purely on individuals of South Asian origin and say, no, uh, 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 apartheid, is wrong because it discriminates against all non-white South Africans. So I draw those links, and that's how I kind of end, end, end the chapter. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you all so much for coming. I'm really delighted to be here. Thank you, Armina, for bringing us together, which is a remarkable accomplishment, I think. <laughs> and, and to Victor for editing this wonderful volume. I have very fond memories of the conference in Singapore, which was a, a lovely gathering. Um, and, and a conversation that has continued, you know, over the, the subsequent years. And I'm really delighted to have this volume appearing as kind of the, the manifestation of that conversation. Um, so, this is a volume that talks about partition as a tool of various kinds of um, enterprises, as a tool of empire, as a tool of nationalism, as a tool of Islamism. And the chapter that I contributed to this book talks about partition as a tool of a kind of emerging internationalism. And I'm going to put that term in quotes um, for reasons that I think you'll see. And um, it, it, so it did this by focusing in on a particular moment in 1947 when the very new novel, indeed, in some ways, United Nations put together what it called a special commission on Palestine, UNSCOP, sent it to the region to, to figure out a quote unquote solution to the problem of Palestine and came up with two different proposals one of which is known as the majority the majority proposal, and I think that the use of that term is an interesting one as well, which proposed partition and was put to the vote in, in the General Assembly in November of 1947 and passed, and a minority proposal, which had a different vision for what could happen to Palestine um, and proposed something more akin to a federal state that would incorporate both Jews and Arabs and, I think, importantly, would assign Palestine's um, quote-unquote holy places to the UN directly. So this is, I, I want to know just a couple of major things about this moment. One is just a kind of straightforward historiographical point, which is that this federal minority proposal that was put forward by certain members of UNSCOP is very in, is, is insufficiently investigated in the literature, right? And we would think that in a field like Palestine, Israel, which is so oversubscribed and perhaps even kind of um, overwritten in, in so many respects that something like this would have received a great deal of attention and it is not, right? So I just want to kind of flag that. I think we could think about why that might be. Um, but in fact, it's a very interesting document and it represents a remarkable and wide ranging set of dissenting opinions on the legitimacy and the viability of the idea of partition, but also about the scope and the nature of the political authority that is being proposed for the new United Nations, right? Um, and so I think that this is, this is a straightforward point that there is more to be written about this moment, about these set of ideas, about the ways in which there was considerable dissent, not just about partition itself, but also about the kind of role that the UN could be expected to play in the making of post-colonial states. So 
that leads me to the second major point here, which has to do with the UN's own self-prescribed role in the making of the kind of decolonial world. And I think Palestine in 1947, and not for the first time, offered an opportunity for people interested in concepts of what they thought of as internationalism to declare their institutions to be the arbiter of things like borders, of populations, of territories, of sovereignty in the post-1945 world, just as empires had been in the pre-1945 world. And it's important, I think, you know, it, it's easy to look back on this moment. We all know what, what came of it, right? And to see this as a kind of inevitability. But I think it is really crucial to remember that in 1948, nothing about this was a foregone conclusion, not what happened in Palestine and not what the UN became, right? Not what, not the kinds of claims that it, be, that it eventually made, um, the kind of institutions that eventually came to comprise, right? None of this had been established yet, right? This is a moment of negotiation. So I think that's quite an important point to make that this investigation about this federal proposal can, um, can lead us towards. So just to draw out a few of the details, I won't go into this in kind of great depth, but um, first of all, a little bit of background. I'm sure that most of you know um, that the first proposal for the partition of Palestine official proposal came from the 1937 Peel Commission, which imagined the segregation of the territory into a Jewish state and excuse me, an Arab territory that would be joined in some unspecified way to Transjordan. And I think I'll note in passing that I think this aspect of non-statehood for the Palestinian Arab piece of the partition proposal is actually quite important, particularly as it was repeated by UNSCOP in 1947. And in fact, I think it's arguable that there was never a partition plan in these decades that represented any sort of vision for actual sovereignty for the Palestinian part of the equation. And in any case, the Peel Commission had proposed that this plan would be accomplished by a forcible transfer um, and anticipated something like 300,000 Arabs needing to be moved and about 12, 1,250 Jews needing to be moved out of their respective areas to create what it saw as an appropriate demographic majority in the Jewish state. When this question of partition was raised once again in 1947, as the British were planning to leave their mandatory territory in Palestine, UNSCOP produced its, part, its partition report, which is called the Majority Report. Um, again, here, I think Victor talked about this a little bit, but I think these terms, the idea of a minority and majority in this political context, as well as in the context under investigation, is notable. Um, the Majority Report proposed partition on the grounds of the unworkability of pluralism as a political principle. And it proposed to the UN as the keeper of what it called international obligations surrounding the nature of territorial sovereignty in these two arenas and what it called minority rights, which is a term that comes out of the League of Nations in the emerging states. Um, now, UNSCOP was operating in a context of a near absolute boycott of its proceedings by the Palestinians. This is something that other scholars have investigated. Um, they objected to its presence and its task on the grounds that the UN had no jurisdiction over Palestine and argued for the most part that the question should be submitted to some kind of international court. So I won't go into this further here, but I, it is worth noting the extent to which this majority report that proposed partition acceded essentially to the basic philosophical and political claims of the Zionist leadership about ethno-nationalism as the primary basis for statehood and also about the political, legal, perhaps even ethical impossibility of ceding any political rights to Arabs in the context of Jewish claims. Mm -hmm. So there was a secondary minority report that was supported by three states, India, Iran, and Yugoslavia. We might note that two of those would eventually be subject to partition as well, that proposed linking the Jewish and Arab communities into a federal state, giving the UN control over the region's religious sites on the grounds that the mandate had failed in its self-prescribed task of preparing these communities for self-government 
and that as such, any continuation of the mandate in any form, including the idea of an independent Jewish state under international protection, would bring the UN into disrepute, right? So the new UN would be non-viable from its beginning because it would be permanently associated with the cause of empire. It also included considerable commentary about how political coexistence between these two communities might indeed be possible once the destructive oversight of the mandatory power was gone. So it refused, this report refused to accept the impossibility of pluralism, right? Um, and, and instead envisioned a situation where once the imperial framing had been removed, it might be possible to come up with some kind of alternative solution. So just to, to finish up here, um, what do we make about this of, of this moment? I think a couple of things, and I'll be very quick. Um, one is that debate about Palestine was not only or maybe mostly about what was happening in Palestine, right? Um, it was about the United Nations. It was about what would happen to empire. It was about the nature of this quote unquote internationalism that was emerging in very inchoate and uncertain ways in this particular moment. And I think Palestine becomes a kind of laboratory for figuring out modes of control and modes of political authority that could be cast as internationalist, cast as cooperative, while also reserving the power to make or break states. And to some extent, we can say that of the Federalist model as well, right? Because the Federalist model was imagining a role for the UN rather than an outcome for Palestine as both a mediator and as one where it would take an active and interventionist role in particular parts of Palestinian territory. So I want to close by saying that I don't think this is a story about how we had a better idea on the table and it was rejected in favor of a worse one. But rather, this is a story about the profound uncertainties surrounding the purpose, the direction, the nature of internationalist power in this moment. And that these two different ways of imagining that international authority in Palestine in the aftermath of formal empire actually shared a vision of taking active control of international active control over borders and populations and to some extent actual territory as well. So I'll close there. And thank you very much. Thank you all for all your uh, uh, presentations and uh, I invite Nandini to please uh, strategy to talk to us about the book, and but I will also switch places with Atif, and then um, he will respond after. It's a it's really a privilege to be a uh, part of this conversation, and I do apologize. Uh, for not being part of it physically because I'm teaching in Exeter. I was teaching in Exeter this afternoon and I have to teach early morning tomorrow as well. Um, when uh, when Amrita invite, told me about this book in the first instance and this, then invited me to be part of this conversation, I thought um, it would be really difficult for me to actually engage in this conversation beyond the level perhaps of an undergraduate seminar where I, for instance, happen to teach um, a module on British Empire and law. And what, in one of the sessions, we talk about Mandate Palestine, but I uh, have so far been um, cowardly and stepped back from the precise moment that you have been talking about and instead talk of the period of creation of legal institutions and the work of different groups of lawyers following Asaf Likovsky's work, for instance, um, during the mandatory period, because I wasn't sure what exactly I can add to that conversation. But I think what they're having listened to your conversation and having actually read this book in detail, what I can share with you is the delight that I took in reading this book. And I'll tell you why I was delighted. I started off by thinking that this is a work in comparative history, which is about the mid 20th century, a period of human history that I did like the most. Um, and also it's in the fields of international relations, sociological theory, political science, all of which are deeply disciplinary um, 
fields which I have very little expertise in. So I felt there was very little I could say about it. In fact, uh, reading the book and then actually listening to, um, now it's just slipped my mind, but was it Victor who said that or Arya in the beginning of your conversations that what really uh, inspired you were the connections rather than the comparisons and indeed as it happened reading the book it's the connections part that had like a several aha moments uh, for me some part of it is really about the pleasure in narrative I was really um, interested to hear how for example the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem was deliberately trying to court Indian Muslim interest by, among other things, doing various religious ritual things, such as offering the possibility of burial um, in a holy Muslim site and so on. But a lot of this can be a delight in narrative and not necessarily perhaps add much more to what we already know, for instance, about uh, Indo-Muslim transnationalism. Um, and, and, and things of that kind. However, I think actually reading the book helped me re-evaluate many things fundamentally. And for that, I thank you. And I'll point to three things that I think changed in my mind as a result of reading this book. I think, first of all, I had in fact been guilty of methodological nationalism in learning and teaching and reading about the Indian partition. And so I had not thought of partition as a tool, as a tool of imperial governance in the first place, but having discovered that, and that was relatively easy to recognize because if you belong to a post-colonial society, perhaps you have, or have association with it, perhaps you've heard this joke before, wherever there's a problem across the world, you can possibly find the British imperial history in it. So at that kind of level, of course, like one could see it as a tool of imperial governance, albeit clumsy and destructive forms of governance. But in thinking of partition as a tool beyond imperial governance, to also thinking of it as a tool of nationalism and as deliberately a tool of nationalism, not a natural outgrowth of nationalism on the first part, leading to very specific and violent forms of social engineering. And then finally, because of Laura's uh, unbelievably important chapter, uh, for me at least, and I'm sorry to not be able to give equal attention to all the chapters, although all of them actually contributed to my uh, understanding. As a tool of internationalism as well, really has made me think of partition as something much more deliberate uh, much more comparable in the sense exactly of being this tool of social and geographical engineering, um, if you like. And I'm not sure what where I would go with that, but just that has been again enough for me. To which I had then another thought, which was about migration, which once again, I had thought of as almost an unfortunate, but natural, if you like, and here is a warning to, of course, any uh, reflexive historian. Whenever you think of any enormous human process as natural, there it probably isn't. And I should have examined it, but your book has helped me to examine it better. So I thought of the mass migration associated with the partition in the Indian subcontinent as something natural, in a sense, um, of a natural outgrowth of the escalation of sectarian tensions and violence, but also of the simple fact of collapse of administration and the possibility of predatory behavior um, on each other. What I hadn't thought about of is of migration as also a tool of social engineering. And a question that came to mind, and here is where I start moving to questions, if that is also okay, because I I I find I think I would find it difficult to separate the questions necessarily from my response. So I was actually wondering when I was reading Laura's chapter, as in whether there were in fact thoughts of compulsory population transfers in the district level divisions that happened in the Indian case, and if not, why not? What did they think would happen? Um. And, and here is where you do kind of fall back into comparative history. It is a connected story, but then there is possibility of comparison for the dog that did not bark, as in why was that not one of those thoughts? Or am I missing something? Was there a thought on this as well? 
The others are that actually appears across several of the articles, including, of course, most importantly, Victor's work, who leads with that concept. But I also found it again and again in Arya's work as well, as in majority rule. On the one hand, an apparently democratizing concept. And indeed, I kept thinking of, a, of the South African case uh, recently. Um, and, and so many things feel, feel so prescient about your book, which was, of course, conceived before the events, before the very unfortunate events that were escalated since October. So this idea of majority rule and how do you actually create conditions for majority rule, once again, I have thought of as extremely naturalized in the sense that all you need to do is cluster those territories, which is the whole federation alternative, if you like, um, and majority rule will follow. And of course, majority rule was also uh, refused in a sense by Hindu politicians of Bengal who chose partition instead so that they would not have majority rule by, by Muslims. But this point about majority rule, once again, like made me think that I had not actually thought of majority rule in this tool driven way. Um, and the things and the social engineering that is actually required in order to make majority rule a possibility. Um, and I'm thinking of it more in that kind of um, interventionist uh, uh, way. There is one thought, and I'll sum up with this thought. I, I feel I have been quite um, inquiet, actually, in my thoughts, rather than give you a structured response, because the book itself is very structured. But it's deeply moving, and that is how I've responded to it. My last point really is, am I wrong in thinking that there is, there is something absolutely egregious about the complete denial of agency to Palestinians um, in the decisions that have continued to affect them until date, because the Indian partition was, of course, a dreadful event. But if we, for one moment, step back and think comparatively, the level of Indian input into the process seems to be disproportionately greater than what the Palestinians ever got to say about their own lands and futures. And why was that the case? I mean, there's obviously the demographic, perhaps the simple size of the number of people and so on. But there is something particularly pointed, I think, about the and poignant about the Palestinian experience, which maybe also, and my absolute finishing point is also something which is the reason which I invite you to reflect upon, is why the Palestinian case, egregious as it is, and I apologize for calling it a case, but I think this kind of instance of human experience, why it has been internationalized in a way that, for instance, Kashmir has not. As in, all of you in this room, of course, know about Kashmir and know about the comparability of it and, of course, the differences. However, Kashmir continues to be nationalized and, and retained between this kind of bilateral conflict paradigm that Palestine has not remained confined to. And here is where I'm actually thinking of Muhammad Ali's work as in there is something about the internationalization of the Palestinian cause, effectively or otherwise history, well, the future will show us, which does not seem to have happened um, in the Indian case. And I wonder why. Thank you once again for having me in this conversation. Thanks very much, Nandini. Um, I think it's, we won't uh, respond immediately. We'll wait for others' response, and then we'll uh, respond with some of the questions you've raised, if that's fine. Well, As if. Thank you so much for inviting me to respond to this wonderful book. I'm very glad to do so, although I feel a little bit very unqualified because it's uh, my field is Arabic literature, Palestinian writing. Uh, but nonetheless, I have read uh, Victor's work before the first book that he published, which I thought was amazing and taught me a lot. And this one too really taught me a lot. So I feel more like a student of this book rather than somebody who really knows the, the details of everything uh, and can talk about it confidently. But nonetheless, I was struck by by a few uh, things in the book, which is, for example, the first chapter, uh, which we've discussed some elements of, of it already. The first chapter in the book, I think it's by Talbot, talks about partition as somehow really uh, something, the outer growth of the local 
aspect, the anti-colonial struggle and the massacre in the, the Bengal region, rather than something that is imposed by the British. It's something um, not the British have imposed, it actually was something locally, organically uh, grown from there. And that the, the, the tone of the book from there on actually takes a contradictory sort of turn because most of the chapters after that highlight actually the international, particularly the imperial British role in in the partition um, in the partition element, and there's quite strong evidence for 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 this uh, for this. So, so I was quite surprised by the first chapter being what it is, and the other chapters speaking uh, to something else, which is mainly how the British orchestrated the partition in in India uh, and Palestine. I was also struck by Victor's chapter where he's talking, which is exactly the point that Emmett has just raised, actually, that you have such agency shown in the case of, it, it seems like an imposed agency in some ways in the case of the Indians. So, for example, the leader of um, um, Pakistan, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, was kind of often seen as somebody who um, who wanted the, the partition, who accepted the partition, but actually seems to have been, sorry, <laughs> that, was, Sorry. that was my mistake. That's all right. Yeah. It seems to have been uh, imposed on 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 him, uh, rather rather than something that he he wanted. So the agency in this case is imposed. But what we see, we have a lot of statements, a lot of deliberations, and particularly in the sense of the way Lord Lord Mountbatten and others. I don't want to talk like a specialist because really I'm not. But I'm just, it raises some questions in the sense that how that agency of the Indian um, leaders and Pakistani leaders came about. And it seems like in the case of the case of Palestine, and I speak as somebody who's from Gaza, you know, so you can imagine the horror of thinking about that situation now, how that agency somehow was given, but it's also kind of limited agency. It's a kind of imposed agency or within the constraints of what the imperial power wants in, wants in that region, the subcontinent of India. Whereas in the case of the Palestinians, agency is really almost non-existent. It's others speaking for the Palestinians and implementing this plan. And then once the Palestinian rejected the 1947 plan, the partition plan, they're blamed later and ever since for not accepting that plan, even though the conditions at that time and the logic of the situation suggest, why should they accept such a plan? Because it's kind of, you know, a minority given much more land than the majority who owns the land. So I was struck by these uh, sort of um, contradiction, as I was also interested in Aries chapter where he's talking about, uh, I think you talked about a point that is not often discussed, which is uh, the confederation aspect. And you referred to Lala Khalil's work, which I haven't have looked at. It's quite interesting. And until today, nowadays in Palestine, the two existing mainstream sort of discussion about Palestine as to how to solve it it's either a two-state solution, according to the resolution 242, or one-state solution, which is mutely discussed because the existing more powerful paradigm in terms of the U.S. and other powers that have stakes in the game uh, is the one-state solution that is not as much discussed, but it's there. But this idea of confederation, it's among, it has remained uh, among sort of scholarly debate, but even widely so. And I was interested as why do you think this is it's perhaps a question why this is uh, not, not sort of uh, discussed enough. And I also was interested in your chapter, Muhammad. It's really quite interesting because you talk about the Muslim Brotherhood and somehow um, the, the discourse becoming more religious uh, and Islam being put you know, at the forefront of the discussion when it comes to uh, the case of Palestine, and as uh, the tone of opposition to the partition becomes more Islamic, um, and I was uh, what I, what I was intrigued by you did for you know Muhammad Muslah's work, 1982, uh, when he talks about Palestinian nationalism, is actually Palestine until that point is sort of regarded as you know what we call just um, Janub Syria, you know the south of the south of Syria. Um, and you know, it's it's a, it seems and and there is the Din al-Qassam also, which is of 
books, the name book. <laughs> you don't discuss him. I was expecting more discussion of of, of that of that uh, of that figure. But also, it's it's a uh, because the discourse or much of the conflict around that time, it's around the Hebrew, the Masjid al Ibrahimi, the Ibrahim Mosque in Hebrew, mm -hmm. or around Jerusalem. So therefore, there's quite a, uh, by the very nature of it, there is Islamic discourse, but it doesn't suggest to it, it didn't seem to me from reading other literature that this was the predominant discourse at that time. There was also national discourse. In fact, it has continued to be the case in Palestine, except for the 60s, 70s, and 80s, when you have a more secular discourse being more predominant. But from that time, you have almost a competition of the Muslim Brotherhood discourse, which has just came off from Egypt in 1928, Hassan al-Banna, and so on and so forth, um, and more the nationalist secular discourse. Uh, which more, which more goes with the spirit of, of the times as well. Uh, I'm not sure where I'm rambling with this, but yeah, you can get the, my drift, I guess. Um, and really, finally, I have some questions too, which is considering where we are now in Palestine. Um, it, it looks dismal, doesn't it? I mean, it's really bad. Um, so, is is partition? What is 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 a um, it, it, first, actually, I will speak to the point that I made, which is actually quite interesting because the Palestinians are totally divested of, of, of agency in this case. They are uh, nobody from the Palestinians now uh, uh, is allowed to say as to what should, how the solution, how how they should be incorporated into the Israel is saying, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, particularly is in his dreams or whatever, fantasy land, he wants to impose a solution on the Palestinians. It's not a solution, it's a destruction of some sort going on on the Palestinians without any consideration to the local population. He wants some spies, some collaborators to work with him towards an aim where they don't have a voice. And it's quite interesting that this persistence of denial of a voice to the Palestinians until today, um, which is, interesting uh, and disturbing, uh, very, very disturbing indeed, as if we have not moved from that historical moment, from, from that historical time in 1948, and actually long before that, when the British middled much in Palestine. Um, but the question is, has partition worked, whether in the case of India, and this is really the question for the panel, has it worked in the case of India? Could it work in the case, in the case of India and Pakistan? Um, maybe this is a rhetorical question because these entities, India and Pakistan, exist, but you have Kashmir in the middle, two nuclear states. It's quite a, a situation there. And then Palestine, can partition work? Um, is it is it still is it still a tool of the international order that exists that can can advance the solution there? Um, and that's perhaps is really my my main my main my main question there regarding Palestine and India whether it, it's it can work or not basically. Thank you. Thank um, maybe we can respond to Nandini and Arthur's questions briefly from the panel and then open each other to the audience. Um, I guess. I think primarily in that law, uh, maybe uh, if you talk about internationalism and the role of empire in the making of partition, maybe start with Laura and then everyone can take it up if you like. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to think about. Thank you both for these really wonderful comments, which I think are profoundly generative. I have thought so often about this question of why Palestinian agency is stripped away. And I actually want to say that I think, you know, this long predates 1948, right? I, I, I think that this is one of the things about Palestinian history in the 20th century is how you can see this process unfolding from the moment of British occupation, right? And this is a question within the scholarship, within the historiography, and also within 
the, the kind of political conversation surrounding Palestine, right? About how how this happened, could it be reversed? What are the mechanisms through which it has been enforced through these different political regimes, right? That we have seen a variety of political regimes, you know, from 1917 forward that all have the same outcome essentially, right? Um, I don't have an absolute answer, but I will kind of throw some of some of the thoughts that I have had about how this happens and why Palestine becomes a space that is internationalized, which I think is a really crucial point, right? That it becomes, you know, it becomes a space in which all kinds of other claims are adjudicated without respect to what is the, the population that is already there on the ground, right? Um, so I, I think that the answer is different in different moments, but that they, these answers build on one another. In the first instance, I think that Jerusalem as a space, because of its place in Christianity and particularly in Western Protestantism, right, in the 19th century, becomes a space where imperial agencies can imagine a, civiliza a civilizational claim that translates into a territorial Right? And that this, unlike most other forms of imperial possession, this has support in the metropole at some very basic levels, right? Um, and so the use of kind of biblical language surrounding Palestine and especially Jerusalem, which is actually not particularly characteristic of Zionism in its early years, um, it becomes characteristic later, but in, in its early stages, it's not. It comes from, from Protestantism, right? It comes from Euro European Protestant traditions. And I think that that buttresses the British claim to Palestine and the kind of broader Western understanding as Jeru of, of Palestine and Jerusalem as a space that somehow belongs to Christendom, right? Um, and that this is, it is not the only explanation, but it is an element that <laughs> differentiates Palestine from other spaces like South Asia. Now, the other thing that I think happens that builds on this point is that throughout the first half of the 20th century, and then particularly after 1945, Palestine becomes, or rather Israel, becomes a solution for what has long been regarded as Europe's Jewish problem, right? And this has a number of manifestations in the interwar period as well, right? There are people who imagine Zionism, you know, people in Britain and France and even in, in Germany, in Russia, right, who imagine Zionism as a kind of solution to the issue of the Jewish presence in Europe. That takes on an entirely new valence after the Second World War, right? Um, in 1945, when the UN is brand new and it's trying to figure out what to do with the remainder of the quote unquote displaced persons who are still in camps across Europe, right? Who will be there. I think the last, some of you can probably correct me. I think the last DP camp closes in 1957. Is that right? Something like that. So it lasts for ages. It just goes on and on and on, right? Why does it last so long? Because nobody wants to take these survivors in, right? The Europe doesn't want them, the US doesn't want them. And so Israel, as a state, as an established place, becomes a solution for Europe's issues, right? And so I think that is also an element here that partially explains why this becomes an internationalized space and why the agency of the Palestinians, which has already been stripped away over a number of decades now, you know, becomes essentially meaningless in the international sphere. Um, so I think we have a long history of multiple explanations that build on each other, but it is truly remarkable, I think, that we could see Palestine as a space through the 20th century where these questions of global political authority are litigated through a very small space and very small populations, right, in ways that really do manage to um, almost entirely strip local populations of of not just agency, but but kind of the acknowledgement of political rights of any kind, right? Um, and it is it is a remarkable story that I and clearly we're seeing some of the consequences of that story now. Anybody else want to respond to that and talk about it? I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, yeah. Thank you. And, um, and, and of course, we all wrote our chapters way before October 7th, but we are in a moment in which you know, 
for good and for bad, we're living in a moment that suddenly people are interested in what historians and, and scholars of these topics have to do, uh, have to say. Suddenly, yeah, people understand the relevance. I used it as a model for my chapter, a quote from uh, uh, Howard Brenton's play, uh, 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 Drawing the Line. Uh, it's actually about the, the partition of India. That, uh, that and there's a sentence that says uh, uh, that um, scar tissue left by empire, dangerous, scar tissue in the sun can flare up. We're definitely now in a moment of that scar flaring up. I think that so much of what we see now sadly uh, uh, strengthens the impression or the argument that uh, many of us had that partition as opposed to the older literature that thought that it's a vent. It has a beginning, it has an end. It may be a, a, a painful and traumatic event, but it has a clear ending day. It's actually not the way to understand it as a political project. It's an ongoing, you, can, you constantly need to make sure if partition is about engineering space, making sure there's a majoritization taking place in order to create this majority. It's a, you you bring not only the tools of, the, uh, of, of weaponry, of military, but legal tools and so on. So it's an ongoing project. And this is why uh, these kind of partition spaces are, are these scar tissues that, that tend to, to flare up. Um, um, and, and I also have very you know, half-baked thought about why kind of uh, the Palestinian voice is so often and muted, right? And how come comparison that seem to us now after doing this research, you know, oh, it makes sense, are not very prevalent. Yes, some activists are making, drawing the connection between Kashmir and Gaza, but it's more in the activist sphere. Not very a lot of scholarly works are following this uh, and, and, and panning it out. And, and, and Lord made very good suggestions. I mean, there are several things that were, were I would add to the equation, not contradict, just to add. Um, that in the interwar period in the 40s, uh, the way uh, it was still difficult to conceptualize Palestinians as a distinct group in a nation, not by the Palestinians themselves, but to sell, so to speak, to, to the metropole. Um, um, do you have uh, relatively small numbers of very erudite and 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 usually Cambridge trained or Oxford, Oxford Cambridge trained Palestinians that can speak to power. You do have this. You have very influential Palestinian intellectual George Antonio in the 1937. You had, uh, of course, the Hurani, Aldo Hurani and, and, and others, but uh, but the great masses are not here. They're, they're uh, um, and, and, and the way in which, of course, the Mufti is seen as an enemy not only of the Zionists, is seen as an enemy of the empire. It's clear why you prefer to, you know, it, in the metropole would mute that, and that kind of ties uh, indirectly your comment. And the double sort of, of boycott, when Palestinians boycotted these international forums, they gained, but they also lost. They rendered themselves also slightly muted in the Israel. I think that changed our sense is kind of a, now, also something that was lacking in, in the 20s, 30s, and 40s is a uh, Palestinian diaspora nationalism present. Now you do have Palestinian voices in the diaspora. It's not something you can read that, but it's very not, uh, not you know, these are sketchy answers. And I think that you answered, you asked about confederation, and I, I thank you for putting the finger on it. And, and yes, absolutely. I mean, I am torn here, and it's connected to one of the comments that Laura also made. When often we, in, in this kind of research, we, uh, the metaphor you know, I, I'm often using, I'm sorry for repeating myself, as, as we're going to the garbage bin of history and we're finding plans that did not pan out, right? Uh, uh, so Confederation was one of them. And I'm torn between two contradictory sentiment, so to speak. One is a bit of a romantic sentiment that I'm not the only one uh, to, to be uh, uh, 
to be accused of it, of uh, this romanticism of road note taking. Oh, if they would have chosen that alternative path, everything would have been rosy and kumbaya and, and nothing, and, and, and history would take a different path. And it is at the, at the same time, in the other sentiment, is that actually when you think about these plans, not because that was a premeditated idea. Often they started preparing the ground to some way of imagining not partition fully, but segregation and separation. You start marking some territories as majority Muslim or majority Jewish or majority Christian. So they are also stepping stones towards the partition. So historically, they actually play a, this double role so um, um and it's part of the, the 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 equation that is there and i think that nowadays when we're thinking about alternatives so we need to go back to these alternative to the minority reports to these alternatives but with a very critical um um come with it with a critical mindset not just saying oh if that was an alternative plan and it didn't work probably it did for, for sure now we have a different blueprint because we, then we end up with the same logic of top-down engineering that uh that did not benefit the region anything else anybody yeah yeah uh, do you want to come in Muhammad Ali first no, you first yeah. Um, yeah, I just like to pick up on some of the points that, that, that Laura mentioned um, in response to Nandini's question mm -hmm. about why was Palestine internationalized in a way that, that Kashmir uh, was not. So I think, I think one of them is, is, is holy places, as, as Laura mentioned, and it's quite intriguing to know that. And the connection between holy places and great powers, so every great power in the West claims the Russians, uh, the French, the Brits, um, and others claimed an interest, Italians, uh, in, in the holy places in Palestine. Actually, when they first came up with their first partition plan, the famous Sykes-Picot uh, agreement, uh, Palestine was given a brown color. It was to have an international uh, administration. That was the original, the original idea. It was Jerusalem, but also other, other holy places and other parts um, of the country. And then the other reason why I think Palestine has been internationalized is because, because it was after the First World War, there's this idea of setting up mandate, League of Nations mandates, and Palestine being part of the Ottoman Empire was seen as, uh, it was a time where of, of, of international relations when there was hierarchy and there was difference, and some people were considered more civilized than others, so in that pecking order, Palestine was put on what they call an A-class mandate. It was always judged about the civilization in a sense of European civilization, raising the standards to, 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 to Europe. Um, and it was because of that, that mandate status after, after the Second World War, the establishment of the United Nations, it maintained that distinction. There were two choices, independence or UN, um, UN trusteeship. Um, Palestine went, they went for partition. But as a result, ever since 1947, it's been on the agenda of the United Nations as a problem. So it's been, you know, again, the Jewish problem in Europe then becomes the United Nations. Palestine problem. And in between all of this, of course, is, is the fact that the mandate itself was a was a project or an experiment, as Lord Balfour used to call it, or social, what we would call social and demographic engineering, uh, using modern expression. The idea was to encourage Jewish migration from Europe to Palestine. So the mandate made it much easier for individuals uh, who, who, were, who were of the Jewish faith to, to become citizens of, of, of Palestine in terms of residency, residency requirements. Uh, and they quotas, and they, they, they were counting uh, and encouraging uh, emigration. Uh, uh, this is, you know, as a result, the, the, the absurd you know, anti-Semitism and then the Holocaust, all these horrors happening, and yet, yet they, they are still, even after the Second World War, there's still this, this encouragement to, 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 to favor immigration uh, to Palestine. You know, the United States and Australia and Canada are maintaining the UK as well, uh, restrictions. So for all these reasons, the UN status, what was happening in Europe at the time, holy places, and the fact that Kashmir was a princely state, and there was this big dispute over, you know, whether they were, you know, over the accession to, to India, um, that it's kind of, it was framed or as a domestic problem, although I know Kashmir was on the UN Security Council uh, in the late 1940s, and it's not clear to me why 
it, it's still not. It's not widely discussed. Uh, maybe others who are, who are more knowledgeable about this can, can explain. But that's one reason why Palestine, I think, the holy places and its international status and the links to Europe and the West in terms of the culture and the population of the people act, and then activism and everything else. Uh, it's one reason why I think I think the Palestine issue gets more more attention. I think, Tibet, can I add yeah. just because it's quite interesting, this point, just a little point, but Mahmoud Darwish, the famous Palestinian mm -hmm. poet, really makes this very apt point to what you were just saying, which is that there's a lot of interest in Palestine, and he said it very clearly, because there's interest in what was described in Europe as the Jewish question. So the interest is not exactly really in the Palestinians, mm -hmm. but actually on the other side, and though the receiving end of suffering are the Palestinians, probably. And you see that in the Peel Partition Plan. There's this crazy quote where they're talking about the, the, the Europeans of the culture of Europe. They go, they go to opera, Italian opera. They're like us. And then the, then the Arabs, they're Asian. They have Asian civilization. They listen to Asiatic literature and culture, yeah. which we don't really understand. So that, 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 that kind of and cultural... This discourse is now the Israeli ministers, you know, when they're talking about the Palestinians, this barbarism, human animals, language, the total dehumanization of the Palestinians is, is very, very. Yeah. And, and just to jump in as well, that it's it, as you said, it is post Ottoman conquest. So really, the League of Nations is supposedly to end all conquests, but it does now, uh, as Laura has argued, that it is an imperial project in, in despite it being considered an internationalist cooperative, and to recognize more. Yes. Uh, uh, what I'm about to say, I mean, I'm trying to articulate a few ideas, but don't take it for a super well-designed uh, framework. And I was super interested, actually, in my colleagues, actually, because, for example, I was, of course, I'm more interested, first and foremost, in political Islam, but I was trying to articulate this with your presentation, all of you here. And actually, I was wondering, for example, about, I was um, questioning myself about the possible specificity of what we call Islamism or political Islam, for example, using these categories of nationalism, internationalism, uh, imperialism. Actually, Islamism does fit with all this. It is a kind of very nationalistic mobilization in the sense that we need to define. So that's why, by the way, I'm going to answer a bit of your question, Victor and Nadif, uh, because there is, in my view at least, we are wrong in, we are doing wrong actually, we are mistaken in confusing or in, let's say, in, um, uh, separating uh, by definition Islamism and Arabism, because actually in terms both of sociological careerism as well as in terms of ideology, you have a lot of similarities. I mean, for example, we were before the country, before the start, we were mentioning the case of Nasser, who used to be a Muslim brother. Yasser Arafat was a Muslim brother. Um, the leader of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt used to be a communist, for example. I mean, the one, one of the ones who is now surviving in the, in the prisons. So all these ideas of having clear, perfectly well-designed, well-defined, I mean, categories, we, we should give up on this. And I think, in my view, at least, we should, let's say, try to find boundaries in terms of, uh, sorry, uh, bridges in terms of, um, of comparisons. But also, in terms of internationalism, because um, Islamic thinkers and, 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 and sympathizers, they have been uh, calling for a sort of trans-Arab or inter-Arab, let's say, type of mobilization that today is missing, at least at the state level, but not at the people's level. We all have seen the World Cup, for example. Of course, it's just an event, but the World Cup has been extremely interesting uh, in terms of understanding, let's say, the, the, the how should I call it, the survival, uh, the ongoing, let's say, the Palestinian, pro-Palestine feelings in the Arab countries, as well as imperialism. Do not forget that Islamism is also built on a desire to restore something called the caliphate. So is it this kind of imperialistic dream or not? But we may have some, let's say, may echo at least this um, uh, pan-Islamic uh, dream uh, designed by Hazrat Benna that I was referring to in the beginning. And also, it's also Islamism uh, has to be seen or maybe seen as an anti-imperialist mobilization, because do not forget that all these people were also anti-Brits, anti-French, now anti-US. So, so, I mean, look at how, I mean, this diversity of scopes or diversity of categories through which or to which we can put, we can put uh, Islamism. So if we consider Islamism as a third word, third word is third word is, sorry, type of mobilization, it also fits with this um, anti-Western, so-called imperial power, um, or imperialist powers, I mean, um, uh, mobilizations. Now, let me go back to this issue of partition, which is one of the key, key, key issues addressed in the book. And I was completely, I mean, I was fascinated uh, when, you were, when you were saying that it's an ongoing process, an ongoing project. But look, for example, at the comparison we can make between, for example, now the, uh, the 
ongoing split or rising split between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Some people actually, when Hamas took power, let's say nearly 20 years ago, and when we started seeing and observing this discrepancy, uh, some people actually, I remember reading things on the possible comparison between Pakistan on the one hand and Bangladesh on the other hand. So partition is not, let's say, a one, two, three, six month affair or issue. It's something which is designed, something it is uh, something which is intentional. If we look, for example, at the, the famous uh, the official speech, speeches made by Netanyahu saying that I need Hamas. I need Hamas to reinforce my policy, uh, my divide and imperium, I mean, policy in terms of, uh, because divide we can't forget, sorry? Divide and rule. Divide yeah. and rule policy. So, which means basically that the main enemy uh, of Netanyahu is not Hamas, it's the two state solution. That's what it means, basically. Um, so this always ongoing re-injuring processes in terms of territories, rearranging the territories, the populations, and so on and so forth. We are still in 2024 living under a partition plan paradigm. I mean, at least in this regard, as well as you were you were saying this. Um, and I'm going to end up, I don't want to be too long, but about this possible specificity of Palestine, which if I look at this through this political Islam lens, which is completely acting, something that I would um, um, that I would um, uh, support. Because, for example, um, if I have written on these issues, I mean, why Palestine is so important for Islamists? So I think that at least to be clear on this, we need to focus on who is saying what. We have different groups, Zionists, the Christian Zionists, for example, the, the, the Jewish Zionists, the, the Western democracies, the Arab states, the third world country. We should, have, we should look at I think, every specificity on each side. But on the Islamist side, clearly, I mean, because of what Victor has just said in terms of the, the centrality of some holy sites. Uh, you were mentioning, for example, I mean, Azam. Azam is a Palestinian. For those who do not, do not know Adam, who he's a Palestinian, the Palestinian founder of Al Qaeda, basically. And do not forget that jihadism has been, at a large degree, uh, in the last 30, 40, 50 years, has been probably know of some very jihadi, famous jihadi thinkers like Abu Qatada al Palestini, Abu Qatada the Palestinians. Uh, Abu Maqdisi, Abu Muhammad al Maqdisi, uh, you know Zarqawi, for example. Zarqawi was raised, educated in the in a very sorry. In Turka, uh, no, he's from Zarqa in Jordan. In Jordan. Oh, he's in Jordan. He was raised with Palestinians. Uh, so it's not only about ideology, yeah. also in terms of sociology. I mean, Qutb Sid Qutb has worked, has written a famous book in published in 1950, So uh, our struggle with the Jews. So in in which he's one of the very first, maybe the first very important Islamic thinker to adopt this anti-Jewish uh, narrative. So it's it, is it because of the holy sites? I think it plays a role, but also it's also a nationalist, I mean, agenda because Palestine is an Arab country, an Arab population, and do not forget that in the 40s and the 50s. Algeria, uh, Egypt starts to be, uh, sorry, ceased to be um, a monarchy and starts to become a republic. Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, all these countries are going. In 46, Syria becomes independent and so on and so forth. So I don't want to be too long, but I mean, all these ideas needs to be, need to be articulated, I think, in order to progress in terms of understanding. Yeah, thank you very much. That was uh, excellent. And I think because we have only about 15 minutes left, we'll take quite a few, like three or four questions before we get responses from the panel. Um, yeah. There's one in the back and then you. Oh, the gentleman's yeah. first because it was- Sorry, yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I, just, just to comment on Jerusalem, I, I think, uh, don't don't just think it's uh, important to Islamists. It's, uh, it's very important for Muslims generally. I didn't realize the significance of Jerusalem until I went there religiously. And um, Kashmir doesn't have anything in, in comparison. That's, that's the truth of the matter. That's why um, that, you know, people will fight over that. Come on, you like or not. I just want to start before I make my contribution, a quick answer to our, our Palestinian colleague. Um, the, 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 I mean, if you talk to my grandfather's generation, who, who were in East Bengal immediately after the partition, they knew what a bloody mistake it was within a year. Within a year. And they actually chose to go into Pakistan because there was a, uh, one of the things that was mechanisms that you had in the Indian partition bill was plebiscites in like, localized areas. And they actually chose an area. And that was all to do with Jinnah coming to Dhaka and uh, announcing that the state language would be Urdu. Um, so th there were issues of language as well. It's, it's, it's another basis of nationhood. It's not just religion, which was the important thing. And Nehru, the irony was Nehru didn't actually speak much Urdu himself and did said it in English. 
Uh, and yet the majority at the time in Pakistan at that point were Bengalis. So there was, and, and, and since, I mean, uh, one of the legacies, I think, of partition was the, un, uh, was the unfinished business uh, of uh, liberation of, um, of Bangladesh, the, the land of Bengalis that was never really dealt with. So one, one of the questions I would like to ask is to what extent when they talked about partition uh, generally, well, once the British bureaucrats, uh, well, in Palestine, did they even consider another basis? Because it's quite clear to me, one of the things I've learned today was that both the Indian and Pakistani representatives in the League of Nations were saying no to the partition. And they, 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 they were obviously drawing from the experience. Here's an example. The, 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 the you know, declaration of the, uh, the boundaries was given two days after, two days after independence was declared on 1415. If there's anything that would cause chaos, small chaos, I can't think of anything more. Because I think a lot of people didn't know which side of the border they were and where they were. That, that has never been taken on board. And I just, yeah, just, just on that basis, I would like to know what, who, I mean, one of the problems we had was that Radcliffe drew those boundaries and he walked away from it. Was there a similar person who did the same in, in Palestine? I, I don't know. And two, I mean, let, let's remember, Mount Batten, pushed this all very for, uh, the partition of India uh, forward much more quickly than was necessary. Um, Thank you. Oh, did that mean did that mean the Brits from there went over and caused uh, havoc in Palestine as well? Or was there a transfer of British bureaucrats from one place to the other? And if so, did they not learn some lessons at least from partition in, in some points as well? Thanks very much. Um, thank you so much for organising me today. I, I've lived in six Commonwealth countries to date. Um, I was born in East Africa and I've lived in Singapore for a long time. And from my personal experience, I'm not a historian, I see, um, I see connections between internationalism, as you said, Laura, and um, the agenda for perpetual war. And um, the weaponization of uh, social engineering that comes through tools of division, which uh, play a divide and rule um, mechanism. And this is how imperialism has been working for more than 100 years. You know, you can go back to the French Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, I've, I've witnessed uh, coups firsthand in places like Kenya. Um, corruption which enables color revolutions, uprisings, funding of rebels. The, 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 the common underlying um, uh, energy needed for all these things is, is money. And, and we, we have to, instead of looking at um, separate things like Pakistan and Kashmir and India and Palestine, this is going to, uh, all these, all these uh, whether it's Ukraine or, or you look at any conflict in the world today, who is providing the money? Where is money coming from? Is the nature and definition of money changing today? Uh, because the petrodollar is perhaps weakening. Maybe the, the BRICS will come up with another alternative monetary system. So has the monopoly waned? Is it, is it having stage four cancer? The, the, uh, the economic and political monopoly that has waged so much destruction in the whole planet because it was funded by the petrodollar or well, before the petrodollar you can call it you know so that's a question yeah so the, 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 look i'm just i'm just wondering if anybody can comment on on the money aspect because if we don't look at that then we don't understand how international agencies work let me take one more um, thank you Is there an, online um, thanks, it's been absolutely fascinating to listen to all the contributions. A um, couple of points I just wanted to ask. Um, number one, um, especially uh, regarding none of these questions to yourself, um, with regards to the link between Palestine and the interest in Palestine versus Kashmir and the interest amongst the entire international community, um, because I came a little bit later on to the, to the session, has anybody in the book mentioned Iqbal Ahmed? Um, who's a very good friend of Edward Said. I think he may be the intellectual bridge which might give you a bit of insight into why in the third world Palestine is such a large issue, beyond obviously all the extra, uh, excellent contributions that have been made in terms of explaining that. So number one, um, 
uh, the interest of Palestine? Are you aware about the side's the side of the involvement, conversations, and contribution? Um, number two, I wanted to ask a very personal question to all of you. How free do you feel doing this research? I, I love the fact that it's been done. Uh, the link was sent to me by my sister. I, I'm not an academic or anything. I drive trains. Um, <laughs> but what's fascinating is the link is being made. I was so um, pleased to see so many different connections being made, which my friends and family have seen between the different issues. The issue of partition. Since a very young age, we were told, Oh, partition was made for X, Y, Z reason. So I wanted to ask, what difficulties did you face mm. in collecting the research, and how free do you feel being able to speak here today? And what challenges do you see with regards to your research, given the scrutiny now on these particular subject areas? So um, yes, thanks very much. I mean, take that. Yeah. So the question from online is probably an extension of your. <laughs> uh, it says uh, Kashmir can be seen as nationalised because India is seen as a major operative. If Palestine is seen as internationalized, within that concept, Israel is seen as a major operative. Israeli nationalism in the area and world power support for funding uh, Israel seems to be seems complete seems to completely undermine the internationalized concept. Why does the panel not connect positioning and funding of nuclear bases across the world with the current situation in Israel? Very, very good. Right. So we have, I think, only time for these yeah. questions <laughs> some of them are more comment than question but if anybody wants to jump in on the panel um, I mean, briefly on the language yeah. issue we actually have a chapter um by uh, iqbal singh severe on, on partitioned identity regional caste and national identity in pakistan so it looks at the imposition of urdu in <coughs> bengal after 1948 in, in, in quite a bit of detail, so I might, that might interest you. Um, you also asked about the whether there was something similar to the Radcliffe line uh, in Palestine. Laura might know. I think it was the United Nations. You UNSCOF came up with the, yeah. with the line, um, but it, it was a proposal and then it was put in the resolution when it was voted through, but, but it was never enforced. So the idea was to, it had an enforcement mechanism that was scared to the UN Security Council, uh, but uh, as we know, they were they were divided, and so so the plan was never in, enforced. So the the United, the United States and the UK got cold feet when they realised that the Soviets would, could have a role in, in in that kind of process, and they didn't want to uh, want them to have a had to have that role. Uh, then there was a question about challenges to research. So uh, this book is a project that based in Singapore, which has a you know it's, it's got freedom of expression issues, um, uh, to put it mildly, but we didn't have any problems uh, doing this kind of research. The problem that I find is when you want you want to discuss more contemporary issues, uh, particularly. But although I might say, paradoxically, since October, uh, since the events in Gaza, it, it feels like one can be a bit more critical uh, than before. Um, but definitely, the, the organising events, um, definitions of anti-Semitism or whatever it is, has caused huge problems with organising uh, events on campus, and and there's a problem of self-censorship. Uh, was a big issue, um, uh, but doing historical, I haven't personally had any problems with historical work like this. It's more, it's more what I want to talk about current events or, or, or other issues. Um, kind of Anyone want to respond to the financial and kind of money angle to international interests? I can, I can speak a little bit. Yeah, and I, I want to connect it to something that Ari said as well. Money is obviously crucial to this entire story, right? And I, I was struck by your comment about how this is an agenda for, for perpetual war. And I think that one of the things that happens from the League of Nations onward, which, you know, the League, as an international institution, what it was doing was ensuring that the channeling of resources to imperial states could continue irrespective of the political arrangements that might eventually transfer, right? So it was imagining a, a system of economic empire that could survive national independence, right? And the mandates, I would argue, are indeed an experiment, right? And they are an experiment in giving those empires time to figure out how this would work to accumulate resources in such a way that political transitions could not interrupt the flow of capital, of goods, 
the, of captive, the, the kind of, you know, continuation of captive markets in the Middle East, that's particularly true for oil, but there are other iterations in other places that have, you know, there are mandates in Africa, for instance, where mineral rights are a consistent issue in mandatory documents there, right? Um, and so one of the things that the mandate system does, and this perhaps relates to some of the other questions about the specificity of Palestine, one of the things that the mandate system does is that it puts into place procedural methods for the registration of objections by the people, the, the subject population, that will, will by design have no outcome, right? So it has a petitioning system where people can put in complaints about how the mandates are not living up to their sacred trust of civilization, in quotes, um, about how, you know, objections to the nature of what are, after all, long-term military occupations of all of these places, about objection, you know, objections to the kind of political representation. The, peti the petition system at the League is a place where complaints go to die, right? And, and it, is, it is designed <laughs> for that. And the reason it's designed for that is not just because people don't want to respond to complaints, but because when you make it clear over a period of decades, that there is no channel for peaceful negotiation, for protest, for demonstration, you force violence. And forcing violence on the ground is the point of this operation, because then the, state, the empires can turn back to Geneva and to their metropolitan audiences and they can say, see, they need us, they need us there, right? So violence is crucial. So violence and money are the two things that, that, that the system is running on, right? And the violence is not accidental. The violence is provoked deliberately to make sure that this process can go on and on and on to legitimize a, a, a consistent occupation over a period of decades and to give people time to figure out how to channel those resources towards the empires in ways that, you know, they know some form of sovereignty, some form of independence is coming. So what the mandates are doing is setting up systems so that when that moment comes, economic empire will continue, you know, as normal. So I think that, I think that's also an important kind of Point here that you know that the, and Palestine is not the only mandatory state, and I actually think that the non Middle Eastern mandates have been sort of underrepresented in the literature about the League and in our conversations about internationalism. But there's certainly you know not least because of the presence of oil in the region, um, you know they they are they are an operational space where these principles are being worked out. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. I know we are out of time, but we can stay here in the room and for a while and you can ask questions no, no. personally. Sorry? No, I said that's nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you very much. <laughs> I want to thank all the candidates.